As an Amazon associate, we earn from qualifying purchases. This podcast is supported by its listeners. If you choose to purchase something using links on our website, we may earn a commission. No books were warped, dog-eared, underlined with purple pen, eaten, cursed, cancelled, burned or otherwise harmed in the making of this podcast. I'm Tom Tolkien and this is The School Reading List, a podcast that recommends books you'll want your children to read and books you'll wish you'd read as a child. To kick off episode six of the School Reading List podcast, let's rip open some book post. And from HarperCollins 360, we have Nine Liars by Maureen Johnson. Stevie and her gang of amateur sleuth friends travel to London to solve a perplexing cold case from 1995. When nine Cambridge graduate friends partied late into the night, only seven of them remained alive the next day. And years later, the murderer might still be active. With a simple and addictively engaging premise, when everyone lies, someone dies, Maureen Johnson weaves a tightly plotted and unput downable story, a compelling read for Key Stage 4 and Key Stage 5 students. Ah. And from Verso, Fighting in a World on Fire by Andreas Malm. Explaining the history, context and development of climate change, this provocative and insightful book invites students to consider what actions might be effective to safeguard the future of the planet. Exploring the philosophy and the practice of protest and radical action, this book will spark debate. Including a raft of writing prompts and discussion questions, Fight in a World on Fire is perfect for secondary school book clubs and is a useful primer for teens interested in climate justice, activism and environmental politics. And this one's from Alan and Unwin. It's a picture book called Floof by Heidi McKinnon. Floof is a floofy cat, in fact, the floofiest cat, and young readers can follow what Floof gets up to in and around the home in this picture book to share with younger children. Charming and memorable, with big, bold illustrations and endearing expressions, the whole family will fall in love with Floof. Mm. And this one's from Usborne, Questions and Answers About Money by Lara Bryan. Where does money come from? How do you earn and manage money? And what makes a good deal? Are all questions answered in this book that includes tips from expert Bobby Seagull. The bright illustrations and lift the flap format makes this a practical and easy to understand text for children in Key Stage 1 upwards. This life skills book helps to demystify what money is and how it works and will help to answer people's questions and misconceptions about money. Highly recommended. And from Chicken House, this is a young adult thriller, Game Over Girl by Naomi Gibson. When Lola gets to try out a brand new virtual reality game at school, she's blown away by what she experiences. But there's a catch. She mustn't use real places or people when she plays, When she breaks that rule, Lola finds herself trapped in a dark dystopia. With a deliciously deceptive plot and an unforgettable ending, Game Over Girl will fly off the school library shelves. Highly recommended for Key Stage 4. And from Faber and Faber, Influential by Amara Sage. Because of her mother, Armand Brown has millions of online followers, none of which she knows in real life. She's an influencer, and everything people see of her has to be perfect, even when her real life is disintegrating. Exploring themes of unrealistic social expectations, discrimination, mental health pressures and manipulated reality, we think this searingly memorable story will be one of the most talked about young adult novels in 2023. 
pertinent and highly prescient. Influential is a must read for all Key Stage 4 students who flirt with the idea of social media popularity. Highly recommended for secondary school book clubs. And this one from Chicken House is Monster Bogey by Anna Brook. When Frank's towering collection of bogeys is struck by lightning, a colossal green monster is born. Can Frank, his friend Tiffany and her four slug sidekicks, save the village of Honkerton? Bound to get right up the teacher's noses, this story is not to be missed. A top pick for your Key Stage 2 library. And another one from Chicken House, Xanthi and the Ruby Crown by Jasmine de Bilan. Xanthi looks forward to the time she spends with her grandmother in her cityscape oasis rooftop garden. But she begins to lose her memory. And with the help of a mysterious cat, Xanthi finds a way to piece together her grandmother's incredible life. Spanning different continents and cultures, this moving story explores themes of home, family, and being a refugee. A beautifully presented flapped paperback with cover art by Bex Parkin, children aged 9 to 12 will pick this up and not put it down. Highly recommended. Little Explorers Maths and Science by Ruth Simons is part of a series from Templar Books. Packed with short bursts of information and colourful illustrations, these maths and science titles from the Little Explorers series blend a chunky board book format with interactive flaps to lift and reveal answers, provoke thought, or just surprise. Topics such as number and shape and space in maths, or the planet Earth and biology in science, are introduced and explained in an accessible way to encourage children to want to find out more. Ideal for guided and shared reading in EYFS and Key Stage 1, this is highly engaging and great fun. And coming out in February from Faber Children's, the Rescue of Ravenwood by Natasha Ferrant. B was only meant to be visiting Ravenwood when her father took her to his old family home to see her uncle and give her mother a break. But B loved the place so much, and her mother did need the rest, so B ended up staying. The Rescue of Ravenwood is an evocative and atmospheric story that will appeal to budding eco-warriors and fans of Eva Ibbotson and Lawrence and John. Read more of Melanie Dillon's review on our website, and the link is in the programme notes. Ah. And from Usborne, This Book Kills by Ravenna Garon. Jess Chowdhury has always tried to be on her best behaviour. As one of only two scholarship students at the prestigious Haybuckle Boarding School, she knows that her position is precarious. With a fast-paced plot and a satisfying ending, this book kills what appeal to fans of Gossip Girl and Holly Jackson's A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. Read more of Melanie Dillon's review on our website, and the link is in the programme notes. Ooh. Wild Oak by C.C. Harrington When Maggie chances upon an exotic pet and its cub roaming free in the Cornwall countryside, her first instinct is to try and protect them, but the adults have other ideas. An atmospheric middle-grade novel that blends unsettling school experiences with an otherworldly ancient Cornish landscape, this plot and the characters are discerningly memorable. Highly recommended for Upper Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3, Wild Oak is bound to spark discussion in school book clubs. Ah. Thank you to all the publishers and publicists for sending us books to review here on this podcast and on our website, schoolreadinglist.co.uk. Here's our rundown of great new children's and young adult books hitting the bookshelves this January. Different Kinds of Freedom by Richard O'Neill 
Look Inside Volcanoes and Earthquakes by Emily Bone. Around the World Vegan Cookbook by Nikki Webster. Granny and Bean by Karen Hess. Life Size Deadly Animals by Sophie Hen. Barry Loser Action Hero by Jim Smith. Shine Like the Stars by Anna Wilson. And Frankenstein, a retelling by Tanya Landsman. Blackbeard's Treasure by Izzy Lawrence. The Marvelers by Donielle Clayton. All the World's a Stage by Sarah Walden. There's a Beast in My Basement by Pamela Bouchard. Game Over Girl by Naomi Gibson. Wild Oak by C.C. Harrington The Magic of Endings by Tom Avery The Storm Swimmer by Claire Wees A Ticket to Kalamazoo Zippy Poems to Read Aloud by James Carter My Strange Shrinking Parents by Zeno Swarder Selfies with Komodos, poems by Brian Moses and Ed Boxall. I am not going to read any words today by Dr. Zeus. Philosophy for Teens by Elizabeth Day. I Am Happy by Michael Rosen. Monster Bogey by Anna Brook. Word Trouble by Viera Bodigieva. Blue by Sarah Christou Monster Thirsty Drink by Sean Taylor Swirls and Swiggles The Boy Who Didn't Want to Die by Peter Lantos Little Explorer's Science Wished by Lisa Evans 100 Things to Know About Architecture by Louise O'Brien And our picture book of the month is Life Size Deadly Animals by Sophie Hen Our non-fiction book of the month is All the World's a Stage by Sarah Walden And our fiction book of the month is The Marvellous by Donielle Clayton Book as you book, let's get reading If you're a teacher, librarian, or avid bookworm who loves children's or YA books, and you'd like to review brand new titles for the school reading list, get in touch by email. We'd love to hear from you. The address is reviews at schoolreadinglist.co.uk. Year One Books. This is a crucial period in your child's reading development. Bedtime stories, reading and sharing, reading and following, talking about reading, predicting and discussing stories and characters, and first independent reading of short picture books are all stages in the development of a typical year one reader. So let's dive deeper into our list of year one books and pick out a few titles that you might have missed. Numenia and the Hurricane by Fiona Halliday. This is a fabulous hardback picture book. A touching picture book story that follows a young bird who struggles against the elements to join and rejoin her family. Told in rhyming verse, this is a great book to read aloud to a year one class in literacy or circle time. The stunning illustrations are an ideal impetus for art ideas. Ah. King of the Classroom by Derek Barnes and Vanessa Brantley Newton. An inspiring and confidence-building picture book that follows a boy going to school for the first time. Ideal for reading and sharing with children starting a new school, class or activity. The artwork with hints of Basquiat is inclusive and this is a useful year one book resource to inspire classroom displays. Mm. Yoki and the Pano Gris by Richard O'Neill. 
This traditional Romany folktale sees Yoki, a boy with lots of ideas and passion for telling stories, enchanting his family with tales of a magic horse who will take them to a better life. This highly illustrated short text is an atmospheric and engaging introduction to Roma life and a good book to discuss with groups in year one. Oof Makes an Ouch by Duncan Beadle When Oof, who is still learning to talk, starts to make up new and interesting words, his best friend Pib gets jealous in this vibrantly illustrated picture book. Great for reluctant readers, mixed ability groups and performing with a class, there's lots of impetus for story writing, PSHE links and wall displays. The Pocket Chaotic by Ziggy Hanauer and Daniel Gray Barnett. A charming and well-crafted picture book story about Alexander, a Joey who lives in his kangaroo mother's Nancy's pocket. His quest for order and tidiness and, ultimately, his independence. There's a lot to discuss here, with themes of organisation, self-reliance and living with other people. With vibrant and fluorescent illustrations, this is a great book for reluctant readers, and also to read to classes in Key Stage 1, particularly at the start of a new school year. The Smile Shop by Satoshi Kitamura When a young boy goes shopping for the first time, just before he decides to buy something, he loses his pocket money. Disaster! But then he discovers a smile shop and wanders in. A refreshing modern fable with strong visual elements, this is an ideal book for sharing, reading aloud and eliciting discussion with pupils. The Emperor of Absurdia by Chris Riddell A wonderfully illustrated fantasy story about a strange world of wardrobe monsters including snoring fish and there's a clever twist ending. Highly imaginative, this is a useful book to develop reading stamina in more independent five to six year olds who have a longer attention span. Mm. Katie Morag's Island Stories by Mari Hedewick Set in Scotland, Katie Morag is a mischievous character who's always up to something. This volume contains four of the most popular Katie Morag stories. A popular series of Year One books, Katie Morag's Island Stories are ideal for children who enjoy empathising with characters. Ah. Not Now Bernard by David McKee Bernard is a boy with an issue. He's found a monster in the garden, and however hard he tries to get help, no one seems to listen. So he tries to deal with the monster himself, with some very funny results. A great book for you one children to discuss in story time. The Dark by Lemony Snicket In this beautifully illustrated story about overcoming fears, Laszlo comes back from a journey never again afraid of the dark. A more challenging and greater depth text that lends itself to group reading, this is an ideal book to help develop ideas for children's creative writing. Mm. You Choose by Pippa Goodart and Nick Sharrett. An unusual and imaginative book that makes the reader think Each brightly illustrated double-page spread has a question, such as, imagine you could go anywhere, where would you live? And invites the child to come up with the answers. This incredibly imaginative book is a gift for infant teachers looking to develop creative writing and help pupils to scaffold story ideas. It's a must-have text for year one. The Adventures of the Dish and the Spoon by Minnie Gray This award-winning short text is a terrific rhyming picture book with stunning illustrations, equally perfect for shared reading, call and respond, and encouraging your child to read independently. And if you'd like to have a look at the other 20 or so books on our Year 1 list, the link to the website page is in the programme notes. Here's a selection of exciting new book tasters sent to us by new and self-published children's authors this month. Hello. 
Has your child's attitude to learning become a little concerning? Watch him fully engage on every page with the bumper book of double learning. Double learning? What's that? Double learning means you learn two things at the same time. For example, you read about the solar system, then use information from the text to calculate percentages. After learning about word types, you read a text about human evolution. Then, through the text, you identify nouns, adjectives, verbs and adverbs. Whilst learning about prepositions, you learn about the human digestive system, and so on. With geography, science, religion and history, jokes, puzzles, games and a murder mystery, all the English and maths a child needs to be learning is in the bumper book of double learning. For more information, go to helenjbailey.co.uk or check out the reviews on Amazon, Waterstones and Goodreads. Hi guys, this is Braulio Petra, author of my new fantasy novel, Lao and Chan, Master Your Art. Lao and Chan, Master Your Art is a fantasy tale about twin brother and sister that are in a big quest for the mastery of their magical powers. The core to their power is the box of life, and the box has an enemy that wants to destroy it. A fellow known as Elo, destroyer of life. The twins' world is counting on them. They must master their powers to save humanity. Reasoning can change situations or behaviors. The twins have to listen to each other so that the world can be a better place for their motherland, Kumui. A great Christmas gift, guys, okay? It's now available on Amazon and Waterstones, okay? Age aimed to young adults and children from 5 to 12, okay? It's now available. And it's a great relationship between a twin brother and a twin sister. All right, guys? You're going to love it. It's inspiring. The story has a great messaging, too. The Silly Adventures of Twighead Larson by John Dredge. Twighead Larson is the silliest person in the whole of Bingleton on Sea. His hobbies include putting loads of bread in the bath and laughing at string. One day, the horrible monster of Upminster, known to his friends as Charles, moves into town for a change of scene. Charles is an enormous yellow thing with terrifying orange eyes and 14 legs. He decides to visit the local townsfolk and be nasty and horrible to them, as horrible monsters so often are. First, he calls on Twighead and sets fire to his garden, throws his toilet out of the window and writes all over the walls. When Charles schedules another appointment with him the next morning, Twighead decides to do something to stop the monster. Twighead goes round to see his best friend, a musician called Banjo Gladys, to discuss the problem. She is clever and brave and is always making up peculiar songs. They plan to build a trap to catch the monster and to ask for the help of acclaimed local inventor and scientist, Professor Lee Jacobs. Hi, my name is Judith Meleka. I'm the writer of a book called The Philosocats. I thought we were friends. It's a picture book about two cats and a tortoise for children from four to nine years old. It's a two-in-one book. There's a story that introduces the topics of anger, trust and forgiveness. And this is followed by a philosophical activity book. The activity book contains 20 pages of philosophical questions and reflections, mindfulness and creative tasks, as well as games and brain teasers. This variety will guarantee that you and the children have fun while fostering critical thinking in children. The Philosocats are available in five languages, English, German, Spanish, Portuguese and Polish. You can find the Philosocats easily on Amazon. Just type Philosocats into the Amazon search bar and it'll come up. My Magical Bearded Friend is a wonderful new picture book written by Chris Husband. With rhyming words and an engaging vocabulary, with an amusing and whimsical tone, it will help even the most hesitant children work on their reading skills. The engaging and imaginative illustrations will entice children to look upon them again and again. These, along with the nocturnal theme, will ensure my magical bearded friend will become a firm favourite at bedtime. You can buy My Magical Bearded Friend online at Amazon and Barnes and & Noble or log on to the website chrishusband.com.
And here's a more in-depth monologue from a recently published new author. Lorna Chantel Scott tells us about her new picture book, Cable Le Crow, and the inspiration behind it. Anybody who is listening to May podcast is important. So hello, important people. My name is Lorna Chantel Scott, and I derive from a very, very, very long line of primary teachers. I am the first generation secondary with extensive teaching experience as an art and design teacher, with elements of drama thrown in. The visual is of utmost importance to me. I am the creator of the 34-page children's book titled Cable the Crow. My aim is that by hook or by crook, I would like to get my book into primary schools. I hasten to mention that the publishers have agreed to publish my second book now, and I'm currently in the infancy of my third book in the series of Cable the Crow. But before I begin, I would like to inform you that my book is aimed at six to eight-year-olds just to qualify. That's the end of Key Stage 1, beginning of Key Stage 2. It is not only for grown-ups reading aloud to children, but it's to encourage children to read independently as they're developing their reading skills. It is geared for children who need more words to read, but aren't yet quite ready to say goodbye to pictures in a book. The main themes of my book are relationships, friendships, inclusiveness, hardships and persistence, accepting gracefully that it is okay to fail sometimes and start again, patience, contemporary messages regarding litter and the environment, kindness and sharing and of course the mystery of bird life. The gist of the book is that Cable is bullied by his wife to go and acquire worms for their breakfast and he reluctantly sets about his given challenge, coming face to face with his worst nightmares and some just plain stupid obstacles on his journey. He meets up with his quirky relatives and friends along a seemingly fruitless journey. So, does Cable finally succeed with his mission? Does he even make it home in one piece? In a moment I will read a couple of my pages for you but they will not be in consecutive order. The story is a timeless crow time, capturing with colour and reading sound a child's imagination, taking them on a journey in a child's world, which should result in the purchase of my book. Now you are at a great disadvantage not being able to see, and trying not to sound like I have an overinflated opinion of my own artwork, minus the visuals, I can only utilise the strength and power of the word alone. So please close your eyes tight and let me take you on section of Cable's somewhat exacerbating journey. Please try to imagine my very special, unique 21st century crow. Imagine Cable the crow in his vibrant red, long shorts and crisp white t-shirt. Now if you are sitting comfortably... I shall begin. Up the road as the crow flies, Cable arrived in Scotland to see Cameron wearing a kilt. Cameron was a chuff. Cable knew it was spelt C-H-O-U-G-H. Cameron knew that Cable was frightened by Bobby the buzzard and said, Skedaddle aft down the road and get your scran, which meant scurry along your merry way and get your food. Empty beaked again, he flew off to see his cousin Hamish. He flew off to see Robbie the Robin at the bird hospital and also see if he could find worms in the ground. Robbie! Robbie, sweetheart! It's time for your injection! Where are you? said an arm appearing from the hospital doors. However, Cable thought the arm's hand was talking to him and then it seemed to be looking at him, or so he thought. He was scared of needles, so empty-beaked again, he flew off to see Blake. At the churchyard, Mary the Mallard Duck, Denise the Dove, Trisha the Tawny Owl, George the Goose, Sammy the Starling, Blake the Blackbird and little Sarah Sparrow were all searching for a lost wedding ring. Cable annoyed Blake by accidentally knocking his top hat from his head. Cable decided he was not dressed appropriately and time to go home. Empty beaked again, he flew back to the fell. And that concludes my extracts. 
I should like to thank you all very much for listening and joining Cable the Crow with sections of his journey, and I sincerely do hope that I have helped to emphasise the enjoyment that children will find following Cable and his friends through this adventure. Conclusively, the only thing left to be said is where my 34-page children's book, Cable the Crow, can be sourced, Retailing at 9 99 paperback and £3.50 ebook, it can be sourced directly through Austin Macaulay Publishers' website, Gardener's Books, Waterstones, Amazon Worldwide, Blackwell's, Barnes & Noble's, Books A Million, Bertram's, Google Books and many more. Contact can be made via my publishers at https colon forward slash forward slash Lorna Chantel Scott dot A M P B K dot com forward slash. Thank you all once again. Goodbye. If you'd like to get in touch and leave a recorded shout out about your upcoming self published children's book, have a look at our podcast webpage for more details. There's been a spate recently of teachers and academics speaking out on social media to encourage various children's books to be banned. Organise waves of disgust are aimed at celebrity authors, lifestyle choices, gender determination, poor word choices, or simply writers who the amorphous mass have decided are neither nice nor deserving people. Perhaps they are, perhaps they're not. But it does seem as if these attacks on books masquerade as veiled personal attacks on the character of the writer. It's worth pointing out that any published book is a team effort. There are illustrators, editors, proofreaders, printers, distributors, agents, publicists, marketers, more printers, proof copy reviewers, bloggers, and people who I've inadvertently omitted, please don't be offended or attack me, who all vicariously share in the flack when a book is attacked. I wonder, are books attacked because they're just softer targets than real people? And let's not forget, the books branded the most indefensible, the most morally corrupt, the most damaging and abhorrent, throughout millennia of history, are all available in bookshops, in national libraries, or to read for free on Project Gutenberg. So if these books are not banned, why are educators so afraid of a celebrity middle grade novel? Banning one book from a school library might not seem a significant act, but it is. Banning one book leads to another and another, and becomes the thin end of a chilling wedge. High-minded arguments to ban books are rarely cogent, and have never achieved any intended aims to improve society, for the same reason that notions of demolishing concentration camps, destroying statues, rewriting history, and cancelling people are not constructive. These actions fail to address the wrongs. They simply place a morality fig leaf over humanity's worst discretions. Banning, destroying and cancelling, in the long term, removes any possibility for society to reflect, progress and change for the better. People need to remember atrocities, injustices and wrongs in order to understand what caused them and make sure they never happen again. Only by understanding what went wrong can we put things right. If we ban a popular book, we simply make it taboo, something to be sought out and something to be subversive and perhaps even desirable. The more popular the book, the more likely the book will be sought out. Let's not forget, getting a song banned by the BBC in the 1970s and 80s was a surefire tactic to achieve chart success. By banning a popular book as teachers, we are abrogating our responsibility to explain and disregarding any opportunity to create positive change. Rather than banning books, 
we should use them as a teaching point. The more popular the book or the author is, the more opportunities will exist to educate. The more offensive the material, the more important it is to explain why and invite students to discuss and understand in order to effect positive change. Surely we want to prevent extreme ideologies and discussing and unpicking them and demonstrating them to be flawed is a big part of what we as teachers in the UK seek to do under the prevent strategy. Banning books is effectively preventing all that prevent stands for. The current government advice regarding safeguarding children from extreme viewpoints recommends providing skills and knowledge to explore political and social issues critically, to weigh evidence, debate and make reasoned arguments. Banning books in the current bestseller charts, which are found in every large supermarket and bookshop, is not a great starting point and flies in the face of educational guidance and research and, in fact, creates gaps in students' knowledge and cultural experience. The more we ban things we don't like, ban everything that offends us, and ban anything we see as troubling, our ignorance will lead to indifference. Once we as a people reach a state of indifference, then we become a society without hope. It's important to remember and never forget all the wrongs in our world and throughout our history. Elie Wiesel explained in his 1986 Nobel Peace Prize lecture why we should remember for the sake of all humanity. To put an end to hatred of anyone who is different, whether black or white, Jew or Arab, Christian or Muslim, anyone whose orientation differs politically, philosophically, sexually, he implored. Remembering is a noble and necessary act. The call of memory, the call to memory, reaches us from the very dawn of history. Talk about books, but please don't ban them. If you'd like to get in touch, use the hashtag SRLpodcast on Twitter or drop us a line using the contact form or messaging button on our website schoolreadinglist.co.uk. And all the books lived happily ever after. The end.